Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome back to Top Traders Roundtable, a podcast series on managed futures brought to you by CME Group, where I continue my conversation with Michael Adam, David Harding, and Marty Lewick, also known as the original founders of AHL and later Aspect Capital and Winton Capital, and who are without a doubt some of the most influential individuals within the managed futures industry. In hindsight, I can see that the world moves a lot more slowly, actually, than I thought it would. I mean, I'm now, you know, I'm now a musician, and amazingly, record labels still exist. I mean, the music business is completely falling apart, and yet they cling on by their fingernails. So things things have a much longer life and are much slower to decay than at that stage in, in my life, I thought. So I was completely wrong. I definitely shared your paranoia about the future of, you know, what we'd done, but I had more faith that one could do further research and discover new things. I had more belief than, I think, because I had more interest in markets. I definitely didn't think that, you know, trend following would work as long as it has, but I did think that, you know, there was a sort of world of other opportunity. I, f I felt that. I felt that very strongly. Mm. I wish I'd felt... Yeah, I'm not sure feeling it more strongly would have helped any more, actually, because, I mean, I think I turned out to be right in the sense that, I mean, the one I pick on is Ken Griffin at Citadel, who he was doing convertibles, which is a completely different world, you know, nothing to do with trend following and so on and so forth, but a lot of money was made in the 90s out of convertibles. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying we could have been Renaissance, right. but we definitely could have developed convertible arbitrage, you know. Sure. sure. And were you allowed to leave straight away when man bought the remaining part? And, and, and what were you thinking back then in terms of what your... What were we thinking? <laughs> yeah, in terms of your future plans. I mean, was there any of you that thought, let's, that's great, let's try and do something completely different? I mean, obviously, later on in life, that comes into your situation, Mike. We definitely had enough of each other by that stage. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Rather than like the Beatles in 1969. It's sad because the partnership was very, very creative. Yeah. And so yeah. we can, you know, we can sort of look back and wonder what might have been. It was undoubtedly a very creative partnership. Yeah. But that's just the way it is. I mean, we um, we wanted to do our own things. We all wanted our own solo careers. Yeah. So, you know. So so uh, I think the timing of it, when was it? Sort of 94, that, that the man bought out the minorities, then they IPO'd, and it felt like a sort of fitting, you know, point. And, and, and like and you, actually, you left quite quickly. I left immediately. As, I as hung as around for about another year, which which felt painful because I I've, I've sort of felt like I was dismantling much of the the overhead and the research team that the man group said, what do we need all these people for? And you had another research operation. So we were kind of doing doing different different things and and no there was there was no lock up after that. I think there was a, a non compete, non -compete period, yeah. period after after we left. But um, when man bought fifty one percent, they did so obviously with the view of corporatizing AHL, which they did. It was a success for them, but it was a little painful for us as well because I'm at, because effectively, you know, they removed the entrepreneurs from their business, which was in the long term interests of the entrepreneurs and probably of the business as well. But it didn't feel like it was in our long term interests at that particular moment in time for any of us at its place. So I don't think any of us felt encumbered by the relationship with man. As I say, that was sort of that transaction for me felt felt liberating. And then we moved on to do you know, shortly thereafter, I think you were the first with Winton. We started Aspect a year or so later. And Mike, you were 
non-executive at the time and then and then joined joined mm. the party later on yeah i want to go to to maybe david first on on this and that is what was then your vision in lack of a better word when you did start winton what did you want to achieve with that Well, that's hard. You're getting a long pause because that's difficult. To, I couldn't achieve. I could. I didn't have any good options right. after I finally left the man group. There were simply no good options. I mean, a, the option I wanted to achieve was doing research into financial markets. Mm -hmm. You know, and for that, you know, I needed a team of people to do it because mm -hmm. you know I am not a computer programmer or researcher myself. You know, I direct operations rather than, <laughs> rather than do it. I mean, I suppose if I was a better person, I would have perhaps gone off and taught myself to program and bought a computer. But I, you know, I already had slightly grander ideas than that. So I, well, I could have, I suppose, teamed up with a bigger company and started larger scale. But in practice, I just teamed up with you know, one and a half, one and a half friends and started at a very small scale. And Winston was very, very small scale for the first two or three years. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Marty, when, when you started Aspect with well, Mike and, and a few others and, were involved? And, and Anthony, Tom yeah, and Eugene. Anthony, I, I, yeah. I mean, there, there, for me, there was, you know, about an hour, an hour and a half, no, a year and a half out, out, of, out of the industry. And, and Anthony Todd, who was, a, you know, an Oxford friend of, of Michael and mine, was by then working for the Man Group. And I credit him with the sort of catalyzing aspect it was really a case of say you know that lack of confidence that we had in 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 feeling like oof, how long will the will the miracle of AHL persist mm. for I think it was Anthony who played back to me saying this is a business this is a business and it's also an underappreciated approach that institutions should be taking advantage of so you know he'd been off to business school he was you know and wrote a terrific business plan for for aspect and 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 it grew from there so we started something like September or October of 97 and then took a year to to establish the business and raise some money and and then started trading tail end of 98 just after the Russian crisis which was very good for you wasn't it so we, we went straight into a doldrums for about a year but but you were already up and running for a good year before we that. Start, uh, yeah, Winton started very low key in February 97 and then started shadow trade, paper trading in June and then started real trading in September mm. and then went down 13% in our first month. Um, Your worst drawdown <laughs> ever actually, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, not quite, but it was the worst monthly. Well, worst monthly month, drawn, yeah, worst monthly I mean, results. Yeah. So at that stage, yeah. having, you know, had the sort of disastrous end of AHL from yeah. my point of view and then the disastrous... Uh, end with man and then somebody was trying uh, to tell you something <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i i thought there wasn't a lot further lower to go after that <laughs> now rightly or wrongly my understanding of winton and aspect in the early years was that both firms had an emphasis on trend following within your strategies and from what i've observed over the years this seems still to be the case for for you marty at aspect but perhaps less so for for you david so let me come to you first on, on this one, David. If my observation is right, when did you begin to move away from the classical trend following approach, if I can call it that? And also, what was your motivation for doing so? It's a question of degree. There's still a fair amount of trend following on what we do. But when we were doing our research in the early 90s, we, I, we did a literature review and looked at what else, what other opportunities there were, and we scoured the literature. <laughs> and get, time and time again, we you know we came across academic papers referring to what is now called carry, mm. the phenomenon of carry, mm. and so we focused a lot of our research on that, and we developed a bunch of trading systems which use that, and we even got as far as implementing those those trading systems, um, but they all went a bit wrong in the um, ERM in, in when Sterling exited the ERM, and at that stage we had quite a bureaucratic sort of board process, and it had become hard to take risks. And so all those systems were sort of taken out again. The only significance is that then went on and worked very, very well for the next 20 years, as well as trend following, actually. And, and you know, we didn't use that until maybe 2005 or 2006 or 2007, but it worked extremely well. And there were other things that we were developing 
you know, back then, which also worked subsequently, they're not in the form that we were developing. Sure. Them. There are some things we developed back then which we still use. We still use today. Okay. But to really expo- f- fully exploit the potential of this kind of research, you have to move into equity markets, mm-hmm. and it took me a long, long, long time to you know develop all the infrastructure and expertise to deal with thousands of equities, databases, corporate actions, and so on and so forth. I mean, by the time we'd done that, the easy money and convertible R was long gone. That mm-hmm. was long gone after two thousand eight, really, yeah. uh, and a number of other strategies the easy money was long gone my own pitch is i just don't think the markets will ever be there'll never be no opportunities for people to do more research in science that's my view some people think we're on the verge of grand a grand unified field theory of everything a grand the, unified the financial field theory of efficient markets and i just don't believe that i know I know people say, well, what is it then? What is the next big thing then? Well, I mean, I don't know. That's why you have to do research. <laughs> Very true. But you've stayed true to your roots in, 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 to a large extent. To, to degrees, to degrees. I, I, I think that Aspect was predicated on this trend-following approach being an important utility that was being overlooked by the investment community. It really did deserve a place in people's portfolios. And the irony... W- w- I think this is all with the benefit of of hindsight, but the irony is that we spent a lot of time doing a lot of research in order to ameliorate some of the characteristics of trend following, because trend following can be quite a a challenging utility, return profile for investors to hold on to. You know, equities tend to go up, 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 and then kick you in the teeth and then recover and go up, up, up. Managed futures have a sort of opposite profile where they tend to make consecutive losses and then give have a very strong run that makes money. And that's intrinsically quite challenging for investors to hold on to, but it's really valuable in, in the portfolio. So the irony was, was that a lot of the research we were doing was motivated by a desire, if you will, to sugarcoat the medicine. Mm. We'd, we'd put all of these other features, like Carrie that David r- refers to, and, and other component pieces, in a small dosage. You didn't want to take away the characteristics of trend following, but that was that was the outlook. It was very much still focused on, on trend following as the core of the business. Of course, these days, we've gone on to do a, a, a range of other things because clients want a, a range of other solutions. I, th- I think the industry, and we can, we can talk about that, but I think the industry has matured or the investors have matured that it's not, this may, I don't know if David would agree with this observation, but it's not now as much a world of, I'm the investment manager, let me tell you what's mm-hmm. good for you and just plonking the, 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 the product on the table. I think it's much more of a consultative exercise where within reason, you know, investors know what's in their portfolio, they know what they're looking for, and and firms like ours, you know, have the component pieces that can put together solutions or products that, that provide a lot of different utilities. So it's not it's no longer just, just one thing. Sure. I mean, I can't help you. Uh, I can't help I can't asking help. you. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, I can't, can't help, help you. <laughs> I can't <laughs> help asking that you <laughs> if you think the decision to maybe stay true or to trend following for at least a, a while longer is is kind of the reason why Winton has kind of leaped the whole industry when we come to size. I mean, it really is. There is a difference now. Absolutely. Between, yeah. <laughs> I want to circle back to you, David, on, on the question of size, actually. And, and if my memory serves me right, and correct me if I'm wrong here, at some point you decide to lower the volatility of your program a bit. So if that is correct, what was your sort of thinking behind doing so? And, and what was the benefit that it had for, for your business and, and for your clients? Well, I think I'm always driven by the memory of October the 19th, 1987. I remember that night very, very vividly Mm. uh, and the next day. Mm. And on that day, the stock market was down 21% and the futures were down 30% because the carry broke free. Mm. So if you're double leverage long the stock market through futures on and that happens again, you'll be down 60 It'll be called so, for margin for us so, to sell. So I don't want it to be down. Yeah, I don't want my sure. in, investors ever to be down sixty right. of an evening, yeah. you know. And that only happened one day in my life. But I want, you know, I don't ever want 
that to happen. So there's a there's what they fashionably now call a hard stop on how much exposure I'm sure. willing to put investors. Sure. I'm willing to undertake on behalf of investors. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and that's my way of dramatising the fact I'm concerned about. Sure. You know, the, I won't say the fat tails because that implies. You know, something that happens once a year. Well, I'm talking about something which happens once every 20 years. So. <laughs> but but also, could you say that losing less when you do lose is actually the way you win in investing overall? I mean, is there something to that? Well, I mean, this, I mean, this remains an area of interest for me, but in a completely bizarrely, I um, I'm still in the investment management business, but in a completely different field. So, okay. in deep value investing, mm -hmm. which is also challenging for investors because Deep value investing consists of most of the time doing absolutely nothing, which of course investors find extremely difficult. Investment managers find it even more difficult, I would point out. So, um, I mean, last year, the fund, I think, only added two, did two trades, essentially, the entire year. That was it. So, I think, you know, with the profile of what you do and the way it's perceived by investors matching those two things together, it remains. So I slightly, I would slightly disagree with Marty. I think it's as psychological, psychologically difficult as it's always been for investors to do the things that they should do mm -hmm. just because of human nature. Mm -hmm. And if you take trend following or you take deep value investing, you could argue that the reason they actually work is that they're so difficult to hold. <laughs> They're so difficult to yes, hold psychologically. Yeah. And That's that, the contrarian view of investing. Uh, you, know, you have to be a contrarian to succeed. Uh, to, to succeed. Yeah. So that managed futures and trend following are not the only contrarian investment approaches. But I think that's the sort of central challenge of maintaining a business around a contrarian approach to investment management is, is how do you match that to the psychological challenge for your investors of holding what you're offering? And it doesn't matter if intellectually they get that it's in their interest truly to diversify. Diversification is the hardest thing to do psychologically. Sometimes for an I investor. say to people, "Do you want to be happy or rich?" Yes. <laughs> so, in other words, when you're out of step choice. with when you're out of step with you, yeah. you know the social the social yeah. pressure, yeah. you are unhappy. Yeah. But that is the right thing to do. Yeah. And so so it's, it's very very hard to do. And, so I think that remains a big challenge. My next challenge. life, the answer will be happy. <laughs> well, I'm joking, but I mean, uh, being maybe rich the, makes you happy, but um, it's a tough uh, as it's a tough road um, to hoe, as Matthew as Mike, yeah. Michael says. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why. So I got back involved with, with, with Aspect, and one of the key events for me that, that, that led me to the conclusion that I should definitively stop is that actually at Aspect we had a market-neutral equity program, mm -hmm. which was very successful it, at the opposite profile. So it had produced a very, well, a mediocre return with, with, with really quite high probability and, and, and was going extremely well. Luckily, we were scared enough of leverage not to have levered it to the... Levered, that's the American term. Leveraged, there's the, there's the European term, uh, as much as some of our competitors. But I thought, we thought it was safe because it was so unlikely to be taken apart by our counterparts. Because yeah. in order to you know, break the back of the strategy would require a whole bunch of closely correlated stocks to be driven apart to the extent that surely liquidity would, would, would come in on the other side. We were completely wrong, mm. completely wrong. At a low liquidity point in equity markets, mm. our counterparts did a you know a classic squeeze on market neutral funds and wiped all of them out. Wow. Interestingly, pretty much except for us. Quake. And that's what was pretty much the event that led me to think I've got to stop doing this mm. because you know yes I f I feel we were lucky enough I found some, you know I feel that we found two or three things back in the day. But I thought if that strategy can be taken apart, then I'm no longer confident that this it's is... time to be happy. It, right? was, it was time to get out and be happy because sure. it was not a happy experience to watch that market neutral fund Absolutely. get taken apart by our counterparts. As in a, in, and, you know, we, I shouldn't go into detail as to who those counterparts are, and I won't go into detail as to how we escaped by the skin of our teeth. Let's just say if I, right, needed, yeah. if I needed a reminder of the challenge of doing this. It's mostly psychological, both for the people doing it and for the investors in it. And I think that's a constant and a remaining challenge and one I could really do without, frankly. Sure. Well, <laughs> maybe on a, on, a, on a related uh, question, I mean, 
historically at least, the raw price of, of a market has been the only input in systematic models, certainly in the trend following space. And the universe of markets have also been very well defined, being highly liquid, exchange traded, like futures on, on CME. But tell me, how have you evolved when it comes to the data you use and the markets you trade? We trade a lot of equities and we use a lot of other data sources, mm. basically. What could they be? Oh, you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, 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 most of the risk is on fairly, is, is on still on endogenous variables like, you know, price intra, in, interrelationships between markets and various, you know, convolutions of the price, you know, sectors and so this sort of sure. thing, you know. We, we have sort of, obviously, we have all the balance sheet data, all the fundamental data, we have all the weather data, we have all the, you know, th there's all sorts of different types of data, but not, it doesn't have, a, at the moment, there's, we have a lot of experimental systems with small mm -hmm. amounts of, small amounts of money on them. Sure. Um, I expect we have one or two bigger allocations with key data inputs, but those I'm, um, I'm keeping to myself. <laughs> what, what about you, Marty? Are you looking in new directions when it comes to data and, 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 and markets, so to speak? And, and maybe I can follow up because that's my next sort of point I wanted to ask is a little bit about are you also moving off exchange and, and, and what's the motivation for doing that? And also what are the risks you have to, to take into account if, if, if indeed you are? Well, so first question with is, is data and evolution of of the trading programs and and you know of course we have an appetite for for new ideas new influences on markets new effects as as david says if we knew what the next big thing was <laughs> we wouldn't tell you <laughs> we, we, we wouldn't tell you and and it wouldn't be research I think there's a there's a lot of hype these days that you know with with machine learning techniques and all this just explosion of, of new data sources that surely the answer's in there somewhere and if you just you know leave it to the the folks at Google you know the, the answer will will be become immediately apparent my view is it's a little bit harder than that there's plenty of work to be done and there's plenty of opportunity so I'm not going to claim that we've got some fantastic new system that uh, employs satellite data and engages a recursive neural net and presto we know what's happening tomorrow and next week mm -hmm. but I so no it is overhyped but on the other hand it's there that data mm -hmm. exists and there's a more more information out there than there's ever been ever mm -hmm. and you need to work out how to assimilate how to digest and how to use that stuff so one yeah. of the experience one of the things our experience will taught all of us is the danger of hindsight bias or overfitting mm -hmm. to data sets mm -hmm. and this you saw this recently in a rich data set or maybe five or six years ago there's google trends is a huge and rich new data set obviously a vast amount of data about the number of google searches and google mm -hmm. developed an algorithm didn't they which forecast when there were going to be flu academics it made the front page of all the newspapers mm -hmm. it made the bbc news and um, you know this is somewhere between annoying and intimidating you know when you're mm -hmm. experience <laughs> when your entire career has been based around you know time series analysis and yep. you see you know these claims being made obviously what we think is you know oh, i wonder if they've really you know, I wonder if they've really Crikey. tested that against say fitting. Of course, it fell apart. It didn't work at yeah, all. Yeah. It didn't work at all. Yeah. So, so because of overfitting. So yeah. there's an example of you know Google, a company which is renowned for its sort of engineering mm. ability, mining a new, rich new data source, getting a massive amount of publicity, and then it you know completely failing. Mm. Uh, and that's not a mistake that. Well, I think uh, you know. I, th I think all all three of us have a healthy paranoia around operating in markets that comes from real experience. Of when I gave the example of um, market, you know, when I even in an area where I thought it was safe, it turned out that it wasn't safe. Mm. Um, that, and that was if I needed a reminder that one's counterparts in markets are not one's friends, then that was the sharp reminder. So I think those things have always applied and will always apply. You mm -hmm. can't research those away. 
there's a big difference between counterparty and client, and this is something that the investment banks got very confused, got themselves mm-hmm. confused about back in um, yeah. pre two thousand eight so. era. Counterpart, counterparties are not clients. Yes. Mm. So, so there's a you know I think I think I think there's a sort of I think all three of us have have been good and learnt um, on, on that score, and I don't think that that is going to change any time soon. And I think a lot of a lot of the apparently new emerging science, you know, science in the space is 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 naive with respect to that. I mean, the way I, so the num the number of times all of us will have heard this, you know, fresh faced research comes in, so they found the most amazing systematic trading strategy. Each trade has a a sixty six percent probability of being right, and and you literally can't lose money. And the great thing is, I'm going to be trading in the FX market, so it's infinitely liquid, and there's absolutely no risk. But then the question I would always observe is, so how much money can you manage? And if some, let's say the answer was, oh, well, we can easily manage $200 million in that, you know, whatever the answer would be. And then say, so do you think it's worthwhile to the people with whom you trade to steal $200 million from you? To which the answer is, yes, I think it is. Well, with a 64% probability trading signal. That is exactly what they will do because that's their job, which is to remove anything with such a high edge that the signal flow itself is valuable. And the markets are brilliant at doing that, and that's good because it makes them more efficient. So uh, when looking for systematic trading strategies, what you need to do is to find something that is fantastically mediocre Mm -hmm. because it's not useful at an individual signal level to your counterparts. Mm -hmm. And that means computers are really bad at finding those things because it's a real self-discipline to understand that that's the challenge you face in systematic trading. It's not to be really, really good. It's not to be useful mm. to markets. I mean, it sounds to me like you're a little bit skeptical about learning. Do you agree with that? That's why it's a difficult discipline. Mm. Skeptical is putting it too too strongly. It's okay. uh, cautious, um, cautious, interested, yeah. you know, me- measured. It, I mean, measured. Are any of you using machine learning today already or small, big, no? Not in the trading strategy, but okay. in research. In yeah. research, yeah. okay. Yeah. And in some in some of the peripheral areas, you know, how, how we allocate to, to different markets, but like David, not in divining think, what's going to happen tomorrow. I think I could make a plausible claim without stretching it too much that we were using machine learning 30 years ago. Mm. I mean, the research work we were doing in the late 80s I, I, is describable as mm. machine learning, I think. I mean, it's... Um, sure. Yeah. Was I mean, it, you know, machine learning is a subdiscipline of statistics and data science, isn't it? It's not actually. It's not. Machine learning isn't neural networks. It's definitely not deep neural nets. <laughs> it is a branch of science, and what we were doing is a branch. Is a sub. Is a subset well, of that branch mm-hmm. of science. If you go and do the machine learning courses at uh, universities today, they have a lot of stuff on, you know, neural networks, influential markets, this sort of thing. But there are lots of other algorithms mm-hmm. that you can use in machine learning. I think really interesting what's happening in Google Translate as, as in, in terms of neural networks, and that's a perfect example of where I think neural networks are incredibly powerful because there, there are no truly catastrophic outcomes. So the mistranslation of a piece of text, admittedly you could say, well, if it was actually used by a machine to then fly a plane into an area, like, yes, <laughs> I know you could invent one, but broadly speaking, there are no catastrophic outcomes. But if you apply the same logic to financial markets, and don't take account of the fact that, hu- that, that uh, human beings and greed are involved. I mean, I don't mean, no, I neither mean greed is bad nor greed is good when I say that, but people are highly motivated to find a way to make money from their trading counterparts. In that world, a machine that learns how to do something in a theoretical world and then does it in a practical world is almost certainly going to have it, its head handed to it on a plate because that's what markets are brilliant at. And markets are actually neural networks. They are hundreds of thousands of people motivated to make money, deploying capital and taking risk with a view to playing a game against each other in which they hope to be on the winning side. That is a neural network. That's a neural network operated by human beings. And that has proved through history to be unbelievably efficient. It's a vastly unbelievably it's a vastly efficient at taking money. Vastly are, powerful. The stock thing. market's a vastly powerful computer. So, mm. so I know, you know, maybe Google can replicate that number of actors motivated. But mm. the way around, I would put it is the world's biggest neural networks are already the markets, mm. and they're unbelievably good at what they do. So beware. Yeah. yeah. No. Absolutely. Very fascinating. I mean. 
Do you do you agree with that, David? I mean, that's what they are. Mm. I mean, it's a bunch of brains. That's neural. <laughs> with a competitive algorithm where the survivors get rewarded with more money and capital, which is exactly what a neural network does. That's exactly how it works. Mm. Human beings turn out to be quite... We've got quite powerful brains. Well, let's jump to another topic that I think our listeners will learn a great deal from, and it relates to the importance of asset allocation. I think Ray Dalio, who runs the largest hedge fund in the world, describes asset allocation as the secret to his success. How would you describe it? And also, how would you explain the asset allocation process that is built into your investment strategies, as well as the benefit that investors have by putting a portion of their investments into strategies employed by by your firms. Marty, why don't we start with you on on this one? Goodness. Um, I guess the the starting place is that the the way we think about asset allocation is more about um, creating opportunity. So there's no inherent prediction of which assets are going to be the, the hot areas, what we're trying to do is trade as many diversifying opportunities as we can in a broad set of opportunities. So we want, if, if there were no liquidity constraints, we'd trade everything we possibly could almost in, in, in equal quantities. But then you have to take into account liquidity constraints and the correlation between those different instruments. Then what the model does, this is one of the beauties of, of the trend following approach, is it identifies, it systematically identifies the opportunity set and does the asset allocation for you, ostensibly. So I don't view asset allocation actually as a separate component of, of, of the model. It, the model dynamically identifies opportunities and moves risk in and out of, of, of those opportunities. Sure. How, how would you describe it, David? I agree with Ray Daly. I mean, what we do is as asset allocation. Mm. Our systems are long or short, the world's major asset classes, and mm. they profit or lose thereby. The difference between Winton and Bridgewater is that Bridgewater, I think, is heavily, philosophically, it's, based, it's heavily based on econo economics and econometrics, whereas Winton, I can't speak for aspect, but AHL and Winton are more based on mathematics, mm. mathematics and statistics, I would say. And we have never, I can say, we've never really had any economics in our models that may be to our advantage or to our detriment. Mm. But I just mentioned that because that is the difference. Right. But otherwise, we're an identical firm to Bridgewater in terms of we do asset allocation. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it depends whether you see asset allocation as something you do before you start trading yeah. or something that follows from the way that you trade. And I think that's a real misunderstanding about, and you certainly what AHL through the years have done, and I know that Aspect has done, which is, as Marty says, asset allocation is a product of a systematic approach to trading as, as opposed to an input into it, yeah. in that the whole, the whole point is you're taking, as, as far as you can, an equal risk allocation to markets, but if you instantaneously look at where your capital is deployed, it shifts like the shifting sands. That's the mm. point. It's moving money around very, very efficiently in a very even-handed way, without needing a you know a you know an analyst to make some call that the next big thing is going to be whatever the next big thing is going to be. So that's that's a product or output of systematic trading, not an input into it. And I think confusing those two things is very challenging. Mm. I mean, you know, so allocating between different systematic trading strategies is extremely delicate and difficult thing to get right. Is there any point where diversification, which is, as, as you mentioned, it's the only free lunch, at least that's what we're being told in, in finance, is there any point in time where diversification becomes diversification where you cannot add more markets or models and get an advantage out of it? Well, there's a mathematical answer to that question, which is that some, what you're looking for when you're building a highly profitable portfolio is things which have a positive expected return 
and low correlation with the other things in your portfolio. Mm. But you never know what something's expected return is. There's always an uncertainty associated with that expected return. That uncertainty may be greater than the expected return. The, the, <laughs> the expected return, the forecast return might be one and the uncertainty might be 10. In other words, uh, over 10 years, so you may have, and indeed this is the situation, you have no certainty that a new thing you're going to add to the portfolio is necessarily going to make money in the, even in the next 10 years. Mm. So where all the quantities that you're estimating, the correlations, the expected returns, and the uncertainties are, are, are so uncertain, you, you, you know, there's, a, there's a heck of a lot of uncertainty in building, mm. in, in knowing whether a new thing added to your model, whether you're putting it in with the right, you know, if, if somebody tells you what the properties of the new, the return properties of the new asset are, and the return properties of your portfolio, then there's only one answer. And if... If the return is greater than zero and the correlation is less than one, then that will always make your portfolio incrementally better. Mm. doesn't mean you should always do it, yeah. but it will always make it. I think mathematically that's probably true. Mm. Yeah. yeah, sure. I want to shift gear a little bit again, and I want to address sort of the low return period that our industry has been in, uh, sort of a drought of five or six years uh, in terms of returns. And, and David, you've started market history going back hundreds of years. Can I ask you whether you can put this kind of market environment we're in, in some kind of historical perspective? What do you think uh, is, is happening at the moment in, in, in this area right now? Well, I, I think as Mark said at the beginning, as Mike said at the beginning, we were trading quite fast and we didn't you know, think that the opportunity would persist for a particularly long time. It's proven remarkably persistent, mm. but over the years, the faster trend following systems that we used to use are not profitable anymore mm. and you know in other words it is not I, I never believe it to be static my view is that you know these trading systems do get worse with time and I don't believe that our forecast chart ratio from trend following or the forecast quality of trend following returns is given by the last 30 years simulation I believe it is worse mm. than that which is why I believe that you know you have to innovate and mm. you have to you know struggle to innovate so I, sure. I think it's getting worse i think what we're seeing is is consistent with it getting worse but that's There's, i mean i do remember i mean to tell a sort of story from back in the day and it actually relates to day i remember david saying back in as soon as the central bank said we're going to target low inflation i remember david saying that'll be a disaster now for many years it didn't seem to be a disaster interestingly i think it was only two quarters ago the economist finally 15 years later agree with you that that was gosh that was a mistake I also remember you selling a flat in Clapham because you could buy two carts of silver and have financed the Third <laughs> Crusade. Um, and so my, my, it's almost impossible to tell the difference between, you know, we've entered a low inflation, low interest rate, artificially low interest rate period for how many years now? Where are we? Ten. For ten, ten. For ten years. History would suggest that that the future won't judge this period kindly in that it, it has the has some very negative characteristics in terms of distribution of wealth, in terms of the motivation of those with capital to deploy it efficiently, its ability to elevate people from from, from poverty is removed because their debts inflate rather than deflate with inflation. And it will end badly. Well, so but the point is it will end. So there's another argument that says, no, this is a temporary hiatus yes. while the world learns again for the nth time over that this is a really bad idea, printing money and having zero interest rates. And when it does, it will end with a bang. And when it ends with a bang, it's going to end with some pretty steep inflation and trend following will make a lot of money, by which time there'll be at least one client left who will be able to say, or one firm will say, I told you so. Yep. And our, idea, our ideas are actually consistent. They are, yeah. I think, consistent because I didn't necessarily say you know, trend following isn't going to work. I haven't right. by any means reduced its, its expected sharp ratio to zero. But as, as Marty said earlier, if you have three losing years and then one bonanza year, yeah. uh, you've got a lower sharp ratio than... In, in the old days, we wouldn't have kept clients if we had a losing year. But then it was, uh, yeah. what were interest yeah. rates when we started? 14, 15, 16%? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to make a slightly more up, 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 upbeat 
<laughs> well, perspective on that. Let, lest our listeners, you know, go and s- sell Slip everything, which is which is number one to, to David's point about the you know decay in the models that we trade. Absolutely, but then the fortunate thing is we all, you know, back to the early point. As scientists, we all sort of just started with with the view that you could always do it better. You got to keep asking questions. You got to keep moving forward. So the static model, if you if you leave your static system alone, absolutely it will decay. If you keep looking for opportunities to improve it, I think you can, you know, be confident that when those opportunities for trend following come along, you will be able to exploit them. And I think the second point is that we have seen periods of low managed low interest rates before, and they have been weak periods of performance, you know, so post 1987, there was the there was a very strong period of performance for for trend following, and then a, a, a very challenging period while while the Fed managed the um, you know the aftermath of the savings and loan crisis, and there was about four or five years of pretty ho hum returns for what we did, and then there was a very strong period of performance. So I would I would number one say you know it ain't over till it's over. There there is still plenty of opportunity out there, and then. Number two, you know, you've categorized this as five to six years in the doldrums. So that's not not our experience. I think there's been there have been some strong periods of performance within there. And then the final observation is, well, if you give up on this approach, <laughs> you know, I, I won't say God help you, but I, 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 I think that using a scientific quantitative systematic approach to investing is is the way it should be done so you know no, nobody is promising you a guaranteed 30 percent a year returns on the program but taking this approach of continually researching investigating innovating is probably the safest bet but also if you were to do to ask the question of investors do you believe that current approach to economic management of the central banks and the current approach of the regulators to financial markets is sustainable or not, most investors would say not. Mm. <laughs> so I, I believe that the real challenge, and has always been the challenge, in, is, is how you make it plausible, possible, palatable for investors to do the right thing. It's not that they don't know what the right thing is. It's just very, very difficult to do the right thing. Very, very difficult. And a period like this makes it more difficult. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Roundtable. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes or SoundCloud and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review on iTunes. It only takes a minute, and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you on the next episode of Top Traders Roundtable.